Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth in our webinar series on the impact of COVID-19 researchers. Today's talk is ethnographic fieldwork across online spaces. I'm Silvana Di Gregorio, Research Director of QSR International, the developers of Envivo. Today's speaker is Christine Hine, Professor of Sociology at the University of Surrey in the UK. Christine has a major interest in the development of ethnography in technical settings and in virtual methods, that is the use of the internet in social research. We want you to get the most out of the webinar both during and afterwards. We'll be taking questions at the end of Christine's presentation, but if any question comes to mind during her talk, type it in the question area in the GoToWebinar interface, and I will put the questions to Christine at the end. Just to let you know that we are recording this webinar and everyone will receive um, a copy of the um, recording uh, afterwards. Uh, we also want you to continue the conversation after the webinar, and you can do that in Twitter using the hashtag EnvivoChat. You can use the Twitter chat to discuss the issues you are facing with one another and to help one another with any resources that you may have. So with that, I shall make uh, Christine uh, the presenter. Um, so just hang on a minute. Make Christine the presenter. And Christine, you'll see Christine's screen um, in a minute. There. Right, we can see your screen, Christine. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so I would like to start by saying thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. Um, you know, we're all hungry at the moment for ways to uh, reach out to one another. And um, so many people I know are struggling with um, research plans that have gone up in smoke. So it's um, really valuable that uh, you've provided this space for us. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do um, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is to talk about um, uh, ethnographic fieldwork across online spaces, ethnographic fieldwork in the diverse mediated publics of online spaces. Um, and, and this is an issue that's uh, been live for me for some time, but I think um, has become particularly pertinent, particularly significant for uh, so many people suddenly, as we are undergoing um, what is an unprecedented reliance on digital forms of communication to cope with current circumstances. And in the process, we've undergone some quite fundamental shifts in everyday experiences of space and time. So Christian Fuchs has written um, a, uh, um, a very stimulating article about this, um, that talking about this you know, transformed experience of space and time. What we're seeing is, is people seizing hold of the various communication tools available to them, repurposing them, using them in creative and different ways. So, you know, we're switching from uh, Microsoft Teams meetings with our colleagues to um, Zoom meetings with another set of colleagues to, um, or oh, maybe this is just my family, uh, extended family Zoom meetings all dressed as pirates on a Sunday morning to keep in touch. The school are sending us um, letters, they're using Microsoft Teams. We're all kind of repurposing, using these tools in creative ways. And as a social scientist, uh, uh, as all of us as social scientists, as ethnographers, we are faced with territory that we fundamentally don't understand. Uh, and actually that the people taking part in it don't understand. So there are some real immediate challenges here in repurposing our research and responding to this transformed uh, communicative landscape. So that's the backdrop to what I'm talking about today. Um, but I'm situating that against and, and focusing on uh, some of the ongoing challenges for online ethnography. So what I'm hoping to do is to unpack um, 
for uh, some of you who may be uh, not used to doing online ethnography, what some of those challenges are and how we respond to them. And uh, for those who are more familiar, then maybe look at some of the issues that you're facing in, in a slightly different way. So I'm just hoping to stimulate a bit of thinking. And um, as Silvana said, it'd be great if some of those uh, conversations can carry on afterwards that um, inevitably I'm going to skim across quite a lot of issues and not dive into specific field settings today, but that might well be something that people want to raise in questions or that can uh, converse with one another about. So the ongoing challenges that I'm going to talk about are the, the challenges for the ethnographer of understanding the meaning of what we're seeing, the challenges that are raised by the digital participation divide, diverse modes of platformed sociality that we come across, the decisions that are involved in settling on a field, a field site for our ethnography, and lastly, the, the issues we face in gaining access and recruiting participants. So I will go through each of those in turn. So I'll start with um, this challenge of understanding the meaning of what we're seeing. And in many ways, this is the classic anthropological challenge of what on earth do these activities mean to the people who are involved in them? What do people think they're up to? So it's the classical anthropologist's challenge. It's, uh, as Geertz talks about and unpacks this example um, from Ryle of the wink. If you see somebody closing and opening an eye, the layers of possible meaning and interpretation that can be laid upon that are the, the, the challenge to unpack and to get to understand. And we, for, instead of the wink, we could put in the tweet. So one of these short um, pieces of text that somebody might tweet, and we might be looking at that as the ethnographer and thinking, what does this mean? What does it mean to the person who wrote it? What does it mean to the people who are reading it? What kind of um, cultural meaning does this carry? Um, and that is a, a fundamental challenge for online ethnography is working out what this stuff means. Um, for, so as I say, it's a kind of, it's a standard ethnic ethnographic challenge, but once we go online, our problem becomes multiplied because when we're looking at that tweet, we are not necessarily knowing who is tweeting that. And we have people with different levels of technological understanding, people with different kind of facility with the tool, some of whom, if they understand certain things about the tool, will, will kind of see nuances that somebody who's less adept with the tool won't necessarily see. The same tool can be used in very different ways. The same tool could be, um, could be in, a, in a work organisational content context where people are part of the same institutional culture, it could be used in a completely different culture, you know, we're seeing, seeing, as I said, that people repurposing these tools for all kinds of different uses currently. So what a particular tweet might mean in one institutional context might not mean the same thing if we're reading it in another context. Different cultural backgrounds, different contexts of the meaning that people bring to it. And we can't take things that we see at face value. There are layers of humor and subterfuge and insincerity. Um, and we all know the problem of working out whether something that we've received by text is a joke or not. So that problem of working out what is meant here, um, uh, layered on the fact that we only ever really see um, uh, the trace the digital trace of the interaction. We can't be at the same time seeing what the person tweeting is and then what all the people who might be reading that tweet, how they're responding, how many of them laughed, how many of them didn't. So much of that is going to be opaque to us as we are trying to work out the meaning of what we're seeing. 
And then we can layer onto that a whole <laughs> set of new kind of issues that the online space has brought to us more recently. So the deep fakes, is this even a human that I'm actually looking at? And there's again a layer of technological kind of uh, sophistication that some people are much more aware of this kind of thing being possible than others and similarly the the chat bots the social media bots um, and um, I was very uh, taken by this paper in computers in human behavior that um, that found that actually people were finding the Twitter bots as quite credible attractive and competent in communication so as we are the ethnographer navigating our way through this space, that that initial challenge that um, that that Geertz kind of explores for us becomes layered with more and more sets of uncertainty in what is going on here and we then have to understand that what one person in an interaction thinks is going on may be fundamentally different to what another person thinks is going on. So the, the, the classic response to this interpretation challenge for ethnography um, relies on the ethnographer's participation. So on the superficial layer, level, as we begin to look at a situation, at a form of communication, we won't understand it as the participants would. But the ethnographer responds to this by immersion in the setting. So taking part in what's going on, being a part of it, gives that kind of understanding um, of a kind of effective understanding as well as a practical understanding of what it is to do the thing that we're seeing being done. Interacting with participants means that we expose our interpretations to being challenged by participants. We can say to people, I think this is what's going on here. How does that seem to you? And they can say to us, yes or no. And then there's the duration. So classically, an ethnographic study will involve a long period of time so that we get the sense of what's going on here from the participants' point of view. How is this unusual? How is this part of the natural flow? Will this strike the participants as being odd or unusual, or will it seem to them everyday business? So those are the classical responses. And, um, and to a large extent, these are very much the way that online ethnographers respond. So, so the forms of our online ethnography that have emerged, um, many of them really do still depend upon these same tropes, these same ideas of immersion and interaction and duration, so that we get to build a sense of the meaning of what's going on here. So this is where online ethnography is potentially quite different to a straightforward um, discursive analysis of a body of data that has been scraped from an online platform. Um, an ethnographer might, uh, might um, do that kind of discursive analysis, but that would be only part of um, a study that also attempted to get to this kind of deeper layer of meaning. But there are, I think, some quite interesting kind of puzzles for an online ethnographer to think about whether that is still sufficient or appropriate. And to think about the extent to which um, we as the ethnographer, are we trying to know more than the other participants about what's going on? So, for example, if we think about Twitter, is there something inherent in Twitter that actually we do never really quite know what the other person intended we project onto them we think we get what's going on we think we know how to fit in in this setting but um there is a level of most digital communications in fact that is about not completely knowing what the other participants are doing or thinking but responding to them anyway so one could say that for the online ethnographer, there is some, some purchase to be offered by saying, I'm going to participate in this as participants do. I will understand this as, do, as they do. And that will involve accepting the same kind of 
uncertainties or obliviousness to one another as they do. So we can't understand the experience of all participants, but we can in a, a quite important, um, effective way, understand how it feels to have to make the assumptions you have to feel in order to make this make sense. So, um, uh, yeah, so here I am sitting here now um, imagining you as an audience, but having to live with the uncertainty of never quite knowing um, who's out there and how you're responding. And that is an inherent part of this experience of this particular form of communication. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll park the question of, of meaning there and then move on to um, the next set of issues, which are around whose words are we actually looking at? Who is producing this stuff? If we think about the fact that as the online ethnographer, our starting point is almost always the publicly visible digital interactions. Um, I'll move on later on to talk about the fact that just staying on that public level is maybe not uh, sufficient to give us a proper rounded understanding of the array of experiences people are having. But if we're starting with publicly available digital traces, we have to contend with the fact that what we're seeing will not be everyone. So. Um, uh, from the Oxford Internet Survey, uh, Blank and Lutz um, have this analysis uh, of representative survey of um, uh, the British data and find that across the main social media platforms, um, none of them are representative of the general population. So age and so socioeconomic status play a large part in who is using any of the social media platforms. And the same very much generalizes to also uh, uh, American settings, um, women, members of underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, and those of lower socioeconomic status tend to contribute to online conversations at lower levels. So uh, there are the kind of two filters here. The one is um, that some groups of people are much more likely to be using social media platforms in the first place and then since not everyone who uses the social media platform actually produces visible content there's that second layer of filter is is who actually um, decides to take part and so again if we're scraping data or if we're using as our field site just these publicly available digital traces, we do need to bear in mind that um, the non-representativeness and that uh, the silent voices of the, of the lurkers may be um, uh, uh, harder to, to access, take more kind of active field work to access. And then those who aren't on the platforms at all will not be accessed in this way. So um, uh, this, this art article um, uh, that I'm quoting from here makes this very important point. That if we're using online field work, if we're using online studies uh, as a basis for policy, policy interventions, we have to stay very sensitive to the voices that are silenced. Um, and, and the same point here, uh, the, this analysis by Schrady, uh, across um, the whole swathe of different forms of online content production, you know, everything from your YouTube videos to your TripAdvisor reviews, um, college graduates far more likely to be producing that kind of content than people who um, only graduated high school. So here, that kind of levels of formal education making a difference. So, so some real important things for, I think, an, an, an online ethnographer to bear in mind. And as we um, shift to various forms of online fieldwork, it's really important for us to keep sensitive to the people who are left out by that shift and, you know, kind of the doubly silenced there, you know, silenced in the standard digital spaces and then they are re-silenced by, by our research. Um, okay, so that 
um, so the online study remains valuable, but also has to come with those caveats. OK, so I'll move on to the next set of issues now. Um, and here, um, uh, using uh, you know, Van Dyke's phrase of the, the platform sociality. Um, uh, and uh, as Van Dyke and as folks remind us, the, also these the platforms, the digital platforms that host so much of our sociality are also proprietary owned platforms um nowadays um and that produces some interesting issues for the ethnographer in terms of navigating across the terms and the conditions of the different spaces as we're allowed to collect data across different platforms um to a to a differential extent um and uh with different challenges in the different spaces of navigating permission to do that but okay if, with that aside as the ethnographer interested in even once we get there what kind of sociality what kind of preconditions on sociality are being set by the different platforms that we find so the different platforms have different affordances you can you can do different things on twitter to what you can do on facebook um, the way of presenting yourself on Instagram is very different to the kind of technologies that Tumblr gives you for being a person and being social with other people. So the platforms are shaping how people can be social. And um, uh, uh, as Madiani and Miller kind of showed us, there's this very interesting way in which we're in situations they call polymedia. We have multiple media available to us and so people's choices between different platforms carry meaning in their own right so if i chose to do this on twitter rather than instagram i'm kind of making a statement about it being a different kind of social action that i'm involved in so there are platform affordances different platforms have different demographic makeups um, Across and within platforms, we have different local cultures. So the, the online communities are not um, uh, completely mappable onto different platforms. Um, so we have some you know, cultures of gaming, for example, are the classic example that um, will use lots of different platforms, but will be still maybe quite a cohesive um, uh, culture, whereas within a large platform like Facebook, for example, we might have many, many, many different groups that we might term as being specific communities. So cultures not coextensive with platforms. Um, we have the algorithmic biases that shape what people can see on the platforms. And we must never forget that the ethnographer themselves are subject to this. So you know, I can't necessarily tell you what is tw trending on Twitter. I can tell you what Twitter is telling me is trending at the moment, but that has already been pre-shaped um, algorithmically for me in particular. Uh, different platforms will have different uh, moderation policies. So on some of them, uh, some content will be weeded out before we even see it or will be subject to an ongoing moderation um, so that kind of shapes the ethnographer's view and the participants view and then there's the the creative appropriation of platforms the way that people take on um, a platform and don't necessarily accept its um, its limitations and, and they creatively work with it so just a couple of examples around this idea of platform sociality. Um, in the UK, uh, there are two quite dominant sites for discussing parenting issues, Mumsnet and NetMums. Um, and the two are really very, they're both around parenting, but they are very different in terms of the, uh, the assumed demographic of the people who use them. Um, they're also very different culturally, their moderating practices are very different. So what you can say on one is very different to what can be said on the other. So if we took any parenting topic, 
and we looked at, at how the conversation went on, on those two platforms, we would find really quite different, different substantive things, different kind of ways of um, uh, addressing the topic. And if I just take mum's net as an example, you know, there is um, uh, a degree of moderation on mum's net. There is, you know, there are guidelines, there are acceptable use policies, but sometimes people don't accept those. So people will use other social media platforms to continue and have those have conversations about the conversations that they have on Mumsnet. So, for example, people on Twitter will be talking about um, something that happened or, you know, kind of creating a sense of, oh, people on Mumsnet will be over the moon at this or she'll be all over Mumsnet, kind of a commentary on. Or if we go to Reddit, we find actually not just one subreddit that focuses on Mumsnet, but um several some of them which are kind of much more celebratory and some of which are almost a resistance movement where people will go and have a conversation that's been moderated out of mum's net or have a conversation about a conversation that's been moderated out so there's a you know layering and layering of the way that different platforms are used creatively by people so that just by looking at the one platform just saying I'm looking at conversations on Mumsnet may not capture the way that the experience of that is being built by at least some of the users of that platform. So all of that adds up to, I think, some quite fundamental challenges um, in if we're social scientists, if we're saying, that, OK, well, I'm using this online ethnography, but what I want to do is to understand um, uh, cultures of parenting. I want to understand, you know, what the identity of a mother is in, in you know, contemporary Britain. If I want to understand beliefs, identities, processes, inequalities, you know, classic social science questions, it gives me with a, cer a certain amount of problem as to say, can I actually claim that I am studying or generating fundamental insights into those issues, given the, all that we've said about how specific these platformed behaviours are? So I guess my first layer of response to that is to say, well, are not all behaviours in some sense platformed behaviours? And as social scientists, we're very used to uh, dishing out the questionnaire, conducting the interview or the fo focus group. And those, in a sense, we could think of as being platformed behaviours. We're providing a platform in which social activity will play out. And, you know, in a sense, um, these platform behaviours aren't necessarily fundamentally different, therefore. Um, but uh, we do have to be conscious of what the platform is and to think about the way in which it is shaping, shaping the, the behaviours. The next then response to that is to say, OK, well, maybe we have to accept that. It's Jennifer Mason's term that our, our methodologies can only ever give us a facet of the situation. So we haven't got a kind of holistic view of identity, but maybe we have a facet of, of identity behaviours um, that we can study here. And one way we can then build on that is to say, well, maybe at least doing some multi-sited or travelling around um, uh, or blended studies between different sites or connecting different sites is a response that allows us to at least understand some of the ways in which specific behaviours are subject to the platforms and also beyond that to start to say how do people connect this up starting to tap into not studying the platform as if it were a bounded site but starting to say how can we make the goal of our ethnographies understanding the experience, understanding 
how people move around between online spaces, move between different forms of public and private interaction and weave something that makes some kind of coherent sense for themselves out of that. So that then leads me into the set of issues really around how we settle on a field. Um, so as we start out, wanting to do an online ethnography, um, it's very important to bear in mind that the field site isn't a pre-existing object. It is something that we, uh, as ethnographers, we make through our decisions, through our research methods, we construct some particular set of um, interactions and behaviours as being the field site for our study. So as we make those decisions, it's important to be quite conscious about them and about creating appropriate field sites for the research questions that we want to ask. And that might involve spanning and crossing over between platforms where it makes sense to do so. Um, uh, so sometimes we might want to do a study of a particular bounded online space that is particularly potent maybe for participants, that has a real particular kind of sense of belonging about it. Um, and hence a very strong um, uh, sense of affect for the people involved in it. So we might want to respect the social, social realities of bounded online communities where we find them. But making that decision is about um, letting participants teach us which spaces make sense to them. So um, rather than maybe always choosing a particular online space, a particular forum and sticking with it, letting participants kind of show us where their experience, where their sense making for the issue that we're concerned with actually spills out onto other platforms. So, um, and I think that's true of, of many of the different kinds of study we might do. So if, if we're um, doing an organisational ethnography, supposing there is a particular kind of, um, supposing they're using Microsoft Teams for everything, okay, so that's fine. We might say, well, I will do an ethnography of the Microsoft Teams space, but should we uh, pay attention to the... Uh, the private WhatsApp groups that people are using uh, to keep in touch with one another, you know, the kind of the on the side Zoom meetings or one to one chats or something that are spilling out beyond that space. If we want to understand the organisation, you know, you could argue that really we should let the participants show us and tell us and that it does involve building sufficient trust with them over time that they will um at least uh, um you know talk about and 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 discuss how those spaces make sense to them it makes more sense in terms of our kind of deeper understanding of this cultural setting it makes more sense in terms of the goal of the ethnography to not have the field site as being confined to what we were initially told was the um institutional platform so that's and that and that's true if we take that outside institutional space you know if we if we're interested in um you know how are parents making sense out of homeschooling at the moment um that question is going to spill out over multiple platforms you know that's a question that's going to say okay well people are trying to make sense out of what the schools are telling us that our kids should be doing at the moment. We're trying to make sense out of the, the platform that we've been given. But at the same time, we are um, what's happening, the other parents going, are you doing all of this stuff or should you do? and we're reading what people on Mumsnet are saying we're you know reading what people on the various news feeds and websites are telling us so the social reality of the experience the social reality of that field of homeschooling your kids for example is is not just restricted to the platform that we've been offered okay 
but trying to do all of this can just be mind boggling. So we need to be uh, conscious that we'll have to make a practical cut in terms of we just can't do everything. Um, and I think uh, fundamentally, we've got to be reflexive about the assumptions that we've made and where we've made a cut, we need to be um, conscious of what that therefore means we can't pursue what we can and what we can't do. And, and there are various um, uh, different ways of thinking about what the shape, what the forming of a field site might be, the ways in which um, uh, and the ethnographer is trying to work out, um, first of all, through being immersed in the space, through being interacting with people, what the kind of space time kind of experiences for them that make sense. Um, and now I've listed here a, a few kind of starting points of ideas where people have taken different models for um, thinking about what the field site is, how to explore it, and how to let it teach us what its um, spatiality is. So, um, focusing on sociality and and uh, mobility focusing on the way that people are kind of moving across spaces or using a hashtag that can kind of kind of connects up a community of interest or following digital traces using different metaphors and Caliandro has this nice mapping of different metaphors that we can use for what's going on or juxtaposing different kinds of data. So Darius Yamiyaniak talking about the way that we can use big data to help us explore a field site and then try and layer on thick data that helps us to understand meaning there. So, um, and certainly mixed methods and a mixture of big data methods and in-depth qualitative have often been uh, quite a strong theme that we see um, in uh, uh, online ethnographies. So some of the kind of purest distinctions between um, qualitative and quantitative uh, somewhat evaporate in this space because there often are big, big bodies of data that we can use to find patterns that might help us to do some of this exploration. And um, for anyone who's at risk of feeling that they want to be completely purist, is this or isn't this ethnography, uh, I'll refer to Martin Hammersley's wonderful um, uh, catalogue of the proliferating um, labels for different forms of ethnography that have emerged over recent years. So um, uh, there's something in there for everyone um, and, and uh, different forms. Um, yeah, not necessarily needing to be too too purist about what ethnography is, but at the same time, I would say holding on to some really fundamental principles of um, some kind of immersed attempt to understand um, experience and um, meaning making in depth. I think runs across all of these um, wonderful proliferating varieties of ethnography. Okay, so just a last couple of thoughts then about um, how we actually manage to do all of this, because I think it's um, it's clear from what I've been saying that this is um, potentially long term and difficult in terms of gaining access as much or maybe more than we're used to in face-to-face -face settings because those initial introductions the getting to know are going to require us to reach across this uh, flaky and uncertain form of communication that we are have now come to rely upon um, but at the same time, for all of those uh, reasons to do with immersion and interaction becomes important. So negotiating access to digital settings, um, I think, is very important ethically, because a lot of the time what we're looking at is forms of interaction that are really fundamentally important to people. 
and personal to people. And so I think a lot of the time, if that's the kind of study we're doing, we will need consented participation rather than covert observation. So there's an ethical aspect to this. I'm not saying that, um, uh, so, you know, the, 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 the kind of the publicness of Twitter, I'm not saying it's not okay to do a, um, a discourse analysis of tweets and so on. But if we're getting to the point where we're really making judgments about the meaning making of of particular participants, then I think we do start to get into the territory where consented participation becomes more significant. And um, for the kind of the epistemological reasons of the ethnographer needing to know what's going on, this um, ethnographic immersion does require some interaction to make, to let us test our assumptions, to let us get to the point of the, uh, as I mentioned, the silenced lurkers and the reactions to online um, content. So for all of those reasons, we often will find ourselves not just scraping data, but negotiating access. The first kind of step really has to be checking terms and conditions um, to find out what we actually are legally allowed to do. But also um, we will need to think about what the gatekeeper situation is with various settings and to think about whether gatekeeper consent is sufficient. And we will, we will often find that gatekeeper consent is necessary, a necessary first step into an online space, but um, there then will be successive waves of um, negotiating access with uh, you know, various uh, groups of participants um, so that gatekeeper consent is often practically not sufficient to ensure that everybody is happy what's go with what's going on. Um, uh, even if uh, we're presented it as if it does does kind of um, uh, give us give us full permission to study everything. Often individual participants may not agree that that's the case. So gatekeeper consent is often necessary, but often not completely sufficient to guarantee that everybody's happy. Oops. Um, and whatever the study, and particularly then if we are moving across spaces, recruitment is going to find um, finding the right people and finding the right platforms in the right way to allow us to study what we want and to allow us to build the kind of trust that we need. Um, a lot of prior familiarization really helps here in choosing a strategy, doing the homework for a long period of time so that you you get a sense of knowing the spaces first um, is, is really important in that. Another thing that's very important, practically speaking, is to make sure that you yourself are suitably discoverable by participants so that anybody you approach probably will want to check you out. Um, so you need to be very careful if you're stepping into online ethnography, make sure that you're suitably discoverable, not too en enigmatic, but at the same time, make sure you're safe, make sure that your own online presence keeps you and yours safe as you go out into the field. Expect to need to explain yourself and your project in terms that, that make sense within the expectations of potential participants. It really, really helps if their agenda can align with what you're doing in some way. Um, so I don't mean misrepresent, but at least kind of try and step into the space that they might be in, even at this point of gaining access and, and negotiating so that you're not simply saying, I need your data for my study, but that it, we can try and build it as much more of a kind of a collaborative inquiry that will make sense in some sense on both sides. And, and finally, there on recruitment, be very conscious that as we step into an online space, if we uh, start to make uh, appeals for uh, people to volunteer to take part in our study, um, we'll often find that volunteers will come forward, but um, they will have their, their own um, interests, their own agenda. So when they're taking part in this, in your study, um, it will be because in some sense they see themselves or they see their project 
within your your study um they'll be making a very altruistic act but at the same time they'll be doing it from a position so important not to fall into the space of thinking that the people who volunteer are fully representative of that that kind of wider population in any space okay so i've um uh romped through a whole swathe of issues there um uh i think you have access to the handout and that will give you this uh the list of um a lot of the the references that i've referred to as we go along um but i think i'd like to uh leave the presentation there and uh maybe we can move back to catch any questions that people may have or topics that people would like discussed that we haven't um got to so far okay so i'll hand back to uh silvana okay thank you um christine um yes we have quite a few um questions here um the first one here is from clemencia and um she wants to know whether this kind of ethnography introduces a bias i know you've talked about bias um and can one claim that the results are valid if if there is a bias introduced by the method and and how do you deal with that bias um yeah it's it's a very good point and yes there definitely is this bias in that we know um yeah certain groups of people are much more likely to have uh you know a public voice um on online than others and i think the responses are to do with um trying as far as we can to open up that space so that we you know maybe talk to some of the people who are are readers you know in any space but not active producers of content but i think the other one is is trying to be as conscious as we can and as explicit as we can be about those biases and and again i would say there is let's not think that this is different so many other methods also have bias so agreeing to take part in an interview um uh oh, the papers yeah the next I'll, I'll i can fish out the name of the paper later on but there's a very nice uh bev skeg's paper on uh, how being being interviewed is a very middle class pursuit and middle class people are very good at producing these kind of lovely interview narratives of themselves and that you know that kind of leaves out maybe the less articulate or uh the less uh accomplished interviewees so not confined to online ethnography but really important issue right um there's um there's been quite a few questions about ethics um mm -hmm. and um in contrast to ethics um with face-to-face -face, um or let's say yeah face-to-face -face methods of collecting data and ethics um and online um, um ways of collecting data and also differences between platforms like differences between twitter and private groups and just um yeah they've been yeah, yeah. sort of all the ethics um, yeah. differences in ethics yeah okay i will scratch the surface of that <laughs> okay um i think point one um if you're setting out to do this kind of study expect to have to put a careful case to your ethics committee your irb um you know i think in a lot of these situations we need those that peer review that comes via ethics committees to help us to make the right kinds of uh, choices. Um, we can use the resources of, for example, the Association of Internet Researchers to help us to ask ourselves the right questions about um, ethical choices here. Um, in, in terms of, um, what those ethical choices might entail. Yes, different platforms have very different um, conventions, very different expectations about things like privacy and the reuse of data. Um, some of that's kind of subsumed in terms and conditions. Some of it um, uh, is, um, uh, you know, more in the kind of the, the taken for granted understanding. And, and as we come to grips with some of these platforms, we have to be sensitive to 
what we find out about what it means to people. So technically Mumsnet is public on the internet, but um, you know, even a cursory reading of Mumsnet tells us that people are very concerned about the idea that journalists kind of take their stories and republish them elsewhere. And so it's public on the internet, but the convention about reuse is much more nuanced than that. Um, so that's, uh, and then there's a, a kind of a set of issues that we have to be very conscious of also about care for participants and care for the people that we might be interacting with. And this can be one really significant difference between this and face to face research. Um, so in a face to face interview, I can see if somebody is upset, I can see if they are hesitant, I can see if there's a point when I should pull back from questioning, offer offer care, direct them to resources and so on. Sometimes that can be much harder to do in online spaces. So if we're doing sensitive research where people may be vulnerable, we have to be incredibly careful about the way that we exercise care for participants. So that, that dimension of ethics can be, can be problematic. Um. We have a, a very specific question here about would you always seek permission to use a tweet that is in the public domain and an associated image? Uh, would I? Um, I don't do a lot of Twitter research, so um, I I tend I tend not. I mean, the convention of Twitter is that actually is 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 kind of runs opposite to a lot of our ethical kind of um, things where we would usually kind of adapt the tweet so as not to out the person concerned and we would not not want to use their Twitter handle to anonymize it but Twitter actually insists that we do um, use the Twitter handle and that we don't change tweets so I think sometimes if it's a particularly consequential thing therefore it could be the ethical thing to do to ask permission for that. I mean, if you think somebody's reputation is on the line, I mean, sometimes I've studied um, uh, professional um, discussion forums and um, somebody may not want their, something that they tweeted or, you know, a, a, a post that they made in a forum three years ago to be resurrected in a different context because they may feel their reputation is on the line. And I think sometimes some sensitivity to that would really be justifiable. I think that do no harm principle is a is a great one to 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 use as the you know the decision making tool there. Right. Uh, again, another one around ethics um, is <laughs> is um, uh, well a gate a gatekeeper um, could allow you access, but there could be individuals who disagree and are not happy as you said, so what should we do ethically? Should we try to convince these people? Can we do observation in a forum where not all people allow us to be there? Do we have to give up? Um, uh, again, I mean, it depends on the nature um, and the extent of the, of the objection. Um, I think often you could find a way through which would be um, about setting some ground rules about what you will actually use as uh, as data that you might record versus you know things that you might simply be in the presence of. So if somebody really doesn't want to be a part of the study, maybe you can kind of um, uh, agree with them that nothing they do will be uh, featured in your 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 formal. Um, data and field notes and so on. So you kind of, uh, it's similar to what you want, would do if if somebody in a, you know, in a face-to-face -face group, if somebody said, look, I don't want to be part of your study, um, you might still be able to um, simply, you know, kind of for practical purposes, ignore them in the ethnography. Because the ethnography doesn't have to be about everybody in a setting. I think that's a really important to keep in mind that you don't, just, just because it's an ethnography, it doesn't mean that you have to write about everybody in the setting. It's about in understanding in depth some aspect of the perspective. So it doesn't necessarily rule out, but if there's any, particularly in say um, support groups where people are vulnerable, where people are really reliant on a space, again, do no harm says, if we're actually threatening somebody's 
practical use of a space that's important to them, then we back away, we go somewhere else, we find a different way to study the issue. They don't have to let us in. Right, okay. Um, another question here about whether, uh, let's say, what about allowing persons, um, people to discuss in their own usual online space versus creating a specific space for the purpose of, of the research? Yeah, I think there is a, I mean, there's a, the, the, you know, the wonderful allure of the kind of the naturalness of um, those found conversations online, which just, you know, are just occurring um, versus the fact that, you know, you can, if you've got a dedicated space, you can properly consent, you can um, have conversations that are on topic. So it becomes more like a focus group, maybe, and less like an ethnography, but that's that's okay and very, very useful and very interesting. Um, uh, the practical issue of really getting people there and getting the consent uh, getting the the kind of the buy-in, the commitment to the study can be can be the challenge. Um, but yeah, certainly people have done some very uh, powerful studies where they've created forums, um, and that can be a way, for example, uh, to deal with the challenges of doing research with younger people, where you know it's a kind of feels a bit dodgy to go around stalking them across different online spaces and making friends with them, but you can properly consent into a, a kind of safe research space and people have done some very powerful things that way. Right, okay. Um, right, I'll take just one more question here. Um, um, so Stefano says, we cannot really know who is behind the user that we find in the online community. How can we overcome this barrier to know if we are talking to a group of people or maybe there are only five people who have different yeah. users that represent their different personality? I feel that people change in each platform. Would it be good to recognize those different roles that they have in each of them? Yeah, I think this is a good point. Um, you know, um, again, you know, social research tends to kind of work on the basis that nobody's going to put that much effort into deceiving us. So generally speaking, most of what people kind of say can be taken as um, at least usable data, if not to be taken at face value. But um, yeah, the way people transform across different spaces, I think there is a huge purchase to be had from trying to connect up some of those. So trying to do some of those studies at least where we look at the experience of the individual that connects up all their different digital kind of experiences. So I think the different models of study, one model of study we can do, which is look at an online community and focus on that. And a different model of study would be to say, look at the, look at the individual, look at the user and let's travel with them across different online spaces. So, you know, there we probably want to do a lot more one-on-one -on -one interviews, diary methods. Um, uh, so, um, you know, pulling in all of those different methods to try and unpack the experience of the individual rather than the space. But, um, you know, I think there is an extent to which um, people a lot of the time aren't being consciously deceptive. Catfishing aside um, and trolling aside and, um, you know, uh, yeah, we haven't even mentioned the dark web, but let's leave that aside as well. Um, uh, I think a lot of the time, you know, so for example, is somebody on mum's net who they say they are? Are they really a parent? Are they really trying to homeschool a child at the moment? Um, I think we can actually look at the interactions between people to let us see whether this is a sensible, plausible thing in that setting. And then that that kind of should be our our lead in order to decide how much scepticism to apply to the performances. Are other people applying scepticism or or not, I think is quite a useful rule of thumb. 
Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Christine. We, we actually have quite a lot of questions and uh, which we won't be able to answer now, but we'll be sending them uh, to you. Um, oh, good. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so, I'll do my um, best. Right. So what I'm going to do is just, um, I'm going to show my screen here and just to um, remind you all, uh, just waiting for the, my screen to come up uh, here. Yes, so that um, just to remind you that um, you keep the conversation going in Twitter, Twitter using the hashtag NVivoChat. And um, just to let you know that we have a few more upcoming webinars on May the 6th, um, integrating transcription with NVivo and June the 3rd to um, explore and visualize your data. And that's on the NVivo website under resources live webinars. Also, uh, we have on-demand webinars so where we keep the recordings of these webinars. And um, if you've missed um, the previous uh, webinars we've done on COVID-19, you can access the recording on our website, again, under resources, under on-demand webinars. Um, so we had the one from Deborah Lupton on virtual field work, on um, Janet Sammons on qualitative data collection, and also with uh, Christina Silver, um, Selson and Bullock on teaching qualitative research um, online. Also, those of those who are working in, in, with teams might be interest, interest, interested in how we can improve team collaboration with NVivo. Um, also, something new is that um, we now have a series, a podcast series, um, put together by um, our, communi our community um, director, um, Stacey Penna, and um, the first three are up um, on our website, again, under resources and NVivo podcasts. And just to let you know that um, we are um, creating a community of practice. Uh, where you can learn about events such as this webinar um, we're having today, plus upcoming podcasts and other resources. So this is a way to connect with researchers across disciplines and organizations. And if you want to join, um, if you go to um, um, go.envivobyqsr.com slash community, you can uh, join up. And for those of you who are new to NVivo, this slide illustrates how NVivo can support you throughout the research process, from collecting data through our upcoming integration with Word, Excel, and Outlook, to our automatic transcription service, to analysis, through collaboration with our new NVivo cloud service, and to support with our variety of training and certification courses. So I just want to thank Christine again for this um, very wonderful webinar presentation that you've given us and thank to you, thank welcome. all of you for attending and I want to wish all of you to stay safe um, in this unprecedented, unprecedented times. Um, okay, thank you.